Good evening. Welcome to the Hannah Brown Finch Memorial Chapel on the campus of Greensboro College and the 2022 Annual Shoyness Lecture. I am Dr. Lawrence Zarda, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the 18th president of Greensboro College in our 183rd year. While all of us have been disrupted and challenged by the two-year-long COVID-19 pandemic, the college is committed to continuing our annual events to the degree we possibly can. Now, we have any number of people here in the chapel with us tonight, but we have many more that are watching online and others who will likely watch the recording later. Uh, we regret that we cannot have the reception at which we usually have after the lecture, just in the abundance of caution because we don't want to be spreading COVID-19. At Greensboro College, our policy is masks are optional. So if you would like to wear a mask, that is fine. If you choose not to wear a mask, that is fine. The Schleunis Lecture is an important component of what is now an ever more respected annual lecture series at the college. The series now includes the annual award lecture in its 58th year, just a few weeks ago. The award lecture is on matters of the intersection between faith and reason, part of the fabric of what Greensboro College is on a core. While on hold during the pandemic, there is also the periodic Reynolds Lecture uh, honoring uh, the late trustee emeritus and college benefactor Royce Reynolds and his wife Jane. That lecture focuses primarily on matters of faith and higher education, but again, has been on hold during the pandemic. The annual Interfaith Festival of Lessons and Carols, the first Sunday evening each December, now in its 55th year, while virtual this past year, was founded by the late Greensboro College religion professor and GC faculty icon, Dr. James uh, Hull. And tonight, the 14th annual Schleunis Lecture, sponsored by a former GC trustee, Richard Levy, and his wife, Jane, the lecture focuses on scholarly research of the Holocaust and related studies. And the lecture honors Carl Schleunis, Holocaust scholar, retired UNCG faculty member, and former distinguished adjunct professor at Greensboro College. We lost Carl this past year, and there will be a special tribute in just a few moments. We regret that we do not have Richard Levy and Jane Lowenstein Levy with us tonight. As I noted, we're all impacted by COVID, and they are stuck in London and are not able to get out to come back for this evening. Having said that, we would note that there are others here with us tonight, a uh, number of guests, but I certainly would want to welcome uh, Rabbi Andy Corin, who is with us. He is the senior, past senior pastor, senior rabbi, um, at uh, Temple Emmanuel, and Carolyn, my wife, and I got to know him on the interfaith study uh, trip to Israel back in 2019. I take the privilege of noting that 2022 marks the 52nd anniversary of the first edition of Karl's book, The Twisted Road to Auschwitz, Nazi Policy Toward German Jews, 1933 to 1939. To my knowledge, that book has never been out of print in the half century since. What a testament to his extraordinary contributions to his field. Most of you will remember that Karl donated virtually his entire personal library to Greensboro College, the Levy Lowenstein Collection housed in Jones Library right here on campus. I now have the uh, pleasure of introducing Dr. Jason Stroud. Dr. Stroud is an assistant professor of history and coordinator for secondary social studies education here at the college. He is in his second year at Greensboro College, but his first year full time. He received his PhD in American history from University of North Carolina Greensboro in the fall of 2019. He specializes in early American history, specifically the American South, and is currently working on a book manuscript about crime, order, and the state of North Carolina Piedmont during the Revolutionary Era. He lives in Burlington, North Carolina with his wife, Jamie, and two sons, 16 and 14 years old. I call to the podium, Dr. Shroud. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zarda. Uh, as, uh, as Dr. Zarda suggested um, or, or pointed out, we do have uh, a, a number of people participating in this lecture uh, on, remotely online through the uh, College Campus Religious Life YouTube page. Um, the lecture should continue to be available on the site uh, long after we finish live streaming it. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Brewer and, and the folks here at the Finch Chapel for, uh, for helping make this happen uh, in, in the midst of some technological difficulties uh, and, and we appreciate all his efforts. Of course, as again, Dr. Zarda alluded to, we all know this is uh, an especially poignant occasion. This is the 14th annual uh, Schlinus Lecture, uh, but it is the first Schlinus Lecture that has, um, after the passing of, of Dr. Schlinus, um, 
who, who passed away in the spring of last year. So before we proceed to, to the lecture, we thought uh, it was appropriate to, to ask Dr. Paul Leslie, Professor of Sociology and Chief Academic Officer Emeritus and friend of Professor Schlonis to, to give a few remarks in his honor. Dr. Leslie. Good evening. It is right to take a few moments tonight to honor the life and memories of the namesake of this lecture series. Dr. Kao Schleunis, who died in May of 2021, possessed abundant, revered qualities. He was a brilliant scholar, a model family person, a bringer of joy, and a virtuoso classroom teacher. Never a cognitive miser, the scholar Dr. Schleunis worked diligently and exhaustively to produce analyses of the policies and actions which led to the murder of six million Jews during the Holocaust. His painstaking methodolo methodology and his approach has, have been praised as indispensable for an adequate interpretation of Jewish persecution under the Third Reich. Dr. Schleunis' work led him to observe that the development of Nazi policies toward Jews was driven by the dynamics of the Nazi social movement and its sequelous internal pressures to preserve the unity of the Nazi party while protecting a charismatic leader, as well as by ideologically heightened prejudices, assumptions of racialization, political scapegoating, and anti-Semitism. His conclusions are still addressed and are being built upon by contemporary scholars in such ways as to enhance understandings of how ideological fanaticism and cumulative conspiratorial radicalization become ritualized and institutionalized in the most heinous of social forms. Emphasizing the significance of Dr. Schleunis' work, one of the eulogists at his memorial service, Rabbi Fred Gutman, Senior Rabbi Emeritus of Temple Emmanuel here in Greensboro, expressed our feelings toward him and bravely reminded us, quote, in an era in which bias, bigotry, anti-Semitism, and racism are on the rise, the message of Kyle's work is now more important than ever. The idea that on January 6th there could have been a violent attempt to overthrow the government of the United States, the inability of Congress to fully investigate what happened, the terrible reality that black men seem to be shot by law enforcement at alarming rates, all of these would seem to indicate that our country, even I would say our world, is bumbling toward authoritarian fascism. Oh, Carl, Rabbi Gutman said, how we need your voice today. Karl Schleunis, your work was not only an outstanding feat of scholarship, but is also an alarm siren to the rest of us as to what can occur when evil is confronted with hand-wringing and silence. Karl was what we Jews would call a total mensch, a totally kind, real, and wise human being. He was a great man, a wonderful scholar, and a man who dedicated his life to the premise that the most horrible events in history should be understood and never forgotten. We will miss him greatly and are saddened by his pa passing." End quote. Dr. Schleunis was an authentic, intellectually honest, and brilliant contributor to our knowledge of the Holocaust and genocide and significantly ad advanced how historical realities may be honestly applied to social circumstances. Dr. Schleunis was also known for his keen devotion to family. A conversation with him never passed without his praise for and support of Brenda, his partner and wife for 56 years, and his daughter, Anna. Brenda and Anna, would you please stand so we may recognize you?
Dr. Schloin has always credited his family and family life for the important everyday delights that sustained him in his academic life. He loved his family dearly. Dr. Schloinis was an exemplary husband, father, and grandfather. It is a risk to break the solemnity of this occasion, but it would not be a true account of Dr. Schloinis' outstanding life without mentioning his penchant for telling really bad jokes and puns. At a meeting we had together to prepare a class on genocide and the Holocaust, he mentioned he had a new joke, and he asked me if he could try it out on me. This is the joke. Did you hear that there is a new restaurant on the moon? Great food, really no atmosphere. <laughs> I groaned too, and then laughed, and I've been laughing at and telling that joke ever since. Dr. Schloinis worked deliberately to bring joy into people's lives and did so in the most sweet and guileless of ways. Dr. Schloinis inspired countless undergraduate and graduate students, many of whom have become proficient scholars of genocide and Holocaust themselves. Without a doubt, the most significant memories I have of Dr. Schloinis focus on his expert classroom teaching. His skillful and practiced pedagogy, coupled with a comprehensive knowledge of history and historical research, were inspirational and a constant reminder of the value of higher education. To teach alongside Dr. Schloinis was a highlight of my career. His legacy to Greensboro College is the continuation of a course on genocide and the Holocaust. My co-teacher in the course now Rabbi Andy Koren believes that Dr. Schloinis' legacy is so important, he crafted to students a message tonight. Rabbi Koren states, we want you and your friends to take this class. We know that the subject matter is heavy. Most important subjects are, but our world is calling for the best and brightest minds to learn about and wrestle with these movements in history as well as in our contemporary world. Activists, future teachers, and leaders of all walks of life do a disservice when they do not expose themselves to these subjects." End quote. Rabbi Dr. Karen's comments honor the facts that Dr. Schloinis was dedicated to his students and colleagues and demonstrated his dedication by honoring the life of the mind even when the subject matter is about egregious social behaviors. The foresight and generosity of Richard Levy and Jane Lowenstein Levy to name this meaningful series after Dr. Karl Schleinis bear fruit tonight in the scholarly presentation of Rabbi Dr. Michael Berenbaum. I believe Dr. Schoenis would have had a wholesome pride in the sponsorship of tonight's eminent scholar and the many scholars to come in this annual series. And so, may we take a moment and pause to pray. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. It is through you that we have all that is good we thank you for the gifts of knowledge, family, joy, bravery, generosity, effective teaching, learning, and so many other gifts you have given us. We ask that our brother and mensch, Kyle, remains for us a blessed and joyful memory. Amen. Dr. Shroud. Thank you, Dr. Leslie. It's now my pleasure uh, to introduce this year's Shalinus Lecture, the Rabbi Dr. Michael Berenbaum. Michael Berenbaum is a rabbi, historian, journalist, and professor. He's author authored, I believe, 20 books and countless works of scholarship and, and journalism. 
He is director of the Siegi uh, Ziering Institute, exploring the ethical and religious implications of the Holocaust at the American Jewish University, where he's also a professor of, of Jewish studies. <coughs> In the past, he's held distinguished visiting professorships at Chapman University, at Claremont McKenna College, at Richard Stockton College, and at Clark University. From 1988 to 1993, he served as project director for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., overseeing its creation. He also served as director of the Jewish Community Council of Greater Washington, opinion page editor of the Washington Jewish Week, and deputy director of the President's Commission on the Holocaust, where he authored its report to the President. He's previously taught at Wesleyan University, Yale University, and has served as visiting professor at George Washington University, the University of Maryland and American University. He is currently a partner in Berenbaum Jacobs Associates, working with Edward Jacobs on the conceptual development of the, in the design of museums. Their projects include work in Cincinnati, Dallas, and in Skopje, Northern Macedonia. For his work in journalism, he won the Simon Rockauer uh, Memorial Award of the Jewish, American Jewish Press Association three times in three different categories. He's been featured on Nightline and the Today Show, as well as national public television, PBS, uh, CNN, and Fox News. And as many of you know, this brief introduction only scratches the surface of his career, his scholarship, and his contributions. The topic of his lecture tonight, Not Your Grandfather's Anti-Semitism, Why Contemporary Anti-Semitism Should Not Be Seen Through the Prism of the Holocaust, is rooted in this scholarship and is all too timely and urgent. Dr. Berenbaum comes to us tonight from Los Angeles by way of a, a drive apparently not in the rain uh, from Charlotte. Fortunately, you got here just before that. And we are very fortunate and deeply honored to have him. So please join me in welcoming tonight's Shalinus Lecture, the Rabbi Dr. Michael Berenbaum. Thank you very much for an overly kind introduction. Uh, first of all, it's a high honor for my name to be associated with Dr. Karl Schlenis. The book, The Twisted Road to Auschwitz, is a foundational work for all of us. And written 52 years ago, it has become sadly, tragically, more relevant now than it was when it was first written. It's a tribute to the nature of his scholarship. Secondly, it's a tragically sad commentary on the nature of our world. And I guess I should say this, that um, one of the saddest aspects of my life is that my work has become more relevant, not less relevant, over time. If I had a dream it, when we were creating the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, if I had a dream for what the ending should be, the ending should be that look at how 20th century humanity behaved, how evil, how awful, how terrible, how inconceivable in our world because we have learned what not to do from their example. But not, that's not the ending that we can foresee at this moment. So I'm one of the very peculiar people who dreams someday to live long enough to become irrelevant and who is sad by the ongoing relevance. Since Dr. Schleinus had uh, such a good sense of humor, I'm going to um, not resist before I begin talking uh, for a moment about the research I've never published. I have a collection now that is about a third of um, an ancient uh, thing called a file cabinet which you students do not know, and even something called a file folder of Holocaust jokes. 
because part of what I always thought was that humor was a tool of the oppressed to deal with their oppression. So because I'm not able to resist the occasion and I was given the precedent, by yours, let me tell you two Holocaust jokes. My favorite. A young boy, 10 years old, is asked in the Warsaw Ghetto, what would you like most of all if you were Hitler's son? Now, one would have imagined, you know, a Mercedes, a, a beautiful home. He said, I'd like to be an orphan. And with all the talent and all the genius in this room, with all the PhDs in this room, I challenge any of us to imagine a better answer than that. It's a humor that reveals a deep truth. The second is a, a story of two Jews who are reading two newspapers. They're not allowed to sit on a park bench, so they're sitting on the grass, really on the cement. And one turns to the other and says, how can you read that garbage? And he says, what do you mean, how can you read that garbage? He says, what do you mean? He said, I read your newspaper, which is the Jewish newspaper that was still publishable in Germany. I read that today is terrible, and tomorrow is going to be worse than today, and the following plans are being decreed against the Jews. The following things are things we cannot do. The following awful things are about to happen. Now I read my newspaper, Der Sturmer, and I realize that Roosevelt is not Roosevelt, but Rosenfeld. That Jews have all the power in the world, that we have um, uh, people in, in, in the, we have Jews in the White House, we have Jews in 10 Downing Street that we control all the financial, the financial resource of the world, all the military resources, why would, for God's sake, why, why, why would I read your newspaper? <laughs> and that leads me in a very indirect way to what I want to talk to you uh, about today. In a sense, um, Jason, uh, it became more relevant with an interesting comment that happened in the public media in the last couple of weeks. Whoopi Goldberg said something very fascinating. She said the Nazi assault against the Jews was not racist. And I scratched my head and I go on the presumption that Whoopi Goldberg was ignorant rather than um, um, pernicious and I said to myself, what is she thinking and what is involved in that? And it's clear that what she was thinking, she thought race was black and white, Jews are white, therefore the attack against Jews could not be racial. And what she didn't understand was the full context of the depth in which in Nazi Germany the attack against the Jews was racial. And it only reinforces how sometimes we have to begin to think in a very significant way about the differences between our conception of where we are and the conception of the world that the historian has. Why was Nazi Jew? First of all, she was half right. Jews are not a race. The best argument why Jews are not a race is that they are multiracial. They appear in many different categories, in many different appearances, many different levels of skin color, many different historical backgrounds. But the largest argument is that we, uh, we accept conversion. That if you're willing to say, my people are your people, my God is your God, you can become part of the Jewish experience, part of the Jewish people. And it seems inconceivable that somebody could say, I now choose to be what, black or choose to be white. That's, not, that's a racial definition and the like. And the other reason is, why did they stigmatize the Jews in what in the history of, of genocide we call symbolization? Why did they put the yellow star on the Jews? Or in Poland, it was the white armband. 
Why did they put the yellow star or the white armband on? Is because Jews are not recognizable from the outside by the color of their skin, even the length of their nose, the nature of their brows. They're not recognizable as Jews, therefore they had to be signified before they could be what? Before they could be victimized. And the Nazis in 1935 came up with a racial definition of Jews based on the religion of their grandparents. If you had Jewish blood, two or three or four Jewish grandparents, you were defined as a Jew. And there was a struggle, ironically, within the German and German government and Nazi bureaucracy between the Germans who wanted to protect, the German officials who wanted to protect that drop of German blood and the Nazis who wanted to get rid of any semblance of Jewish blood. And consequently, the definition of Jews was purely racial and the Nazi ideology was deeply and profoundly racial. Would there be a master race, those who are close to the master race, and then the whole range of subordinate races and one group of people, the Jews, were defined. Jews were defined as a cancer on society, and we'll see how that definition functioned, which led ultimately not only to their elimination, but to what, what the Nazis called extermination, the annihilation of the Jewish people. So in a very sense, it's deeply racial, deeply ingrained, part of a racial battle. And as Karl's work showed and subsequent works sub, uh, supplemented and enhanced and deepened, the idea is that the Nazis fought two wars, a world war and a war against the Jews, or even a larger war, a racial war, and the American people and the world fought one war, which was merely the world war and not the racial war. Now I'm gonna take you in a very different direction. Everybody believes that anti-Semitism is on the rise. And one of the prisms that I hope we don't have to see anti-Semitism through is the prism of the Holocaust. And I think it's a mistake to view anti-Semitism today through the prism of the Holocaust. And hopefully it will be a mistake tomorrow and the day after tomorrow to see it through that prism. Let's begin with some elemental understanding. Anti-Semitism varies according to its source. There is religious anti-Semitism, political anti-Semitism, economic anti-Semitism, social anti-Semitism, and ultimately racial anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, and by the way, religious anti-Semitism, if you want to be precise, religious anti-Semitism can really be called anti-Judaism. And that means that you oppose Judaism and you discriminate against the Jew because of the religion they hold. Under Nazism, we saw something quite remarkable, which is that the definition of Jews was biological based on the religion of their grandparents, not on the identity they affirmed, the tradition they practiced, the religious beliefs that they held, even if they embraced those religious beliefs. And to make it vivid for you, the last building standing in the Warsaw Ghetto was a Roman Catholic church whose attendants were Roman Catholic parishioners who had Jewish blood in their ancestry and who were serviced by Roman Catholic priests who had Jewish blood in their ancestry and Roman Catholic nuns who also had Jewish blood in their ancestry. The state defined them as Jews. The religion defined them as Christians. So there's religious anti-Semitism. There is social anti-Semitism. You want to understand social anti-Semitism, and social anti-Semitism had a tremendous impact on the shape of the United States in a very particular way. Let me, be, in honor of, of, of Carl, let me uh, 
recite Groucho Marx's definition of social anti-Semitism. Groucho Marx defined social anti-Semitism by saying, I would never want to belong to a club that would have me as a member. In other words, any club that excluded the Jews socially, that meant it had class and character and that's where he wanted to be. Social anti-Semitism means keep Jews apart. It used to be the habit that uh, what they called five o'clock shadow. Five o'clock shadow was that you could work with Jews during the day, but after five o'clock you socialized differently. That ironically led to the creation of Jewish counter institutions. In New York, you have Mount Sinai Hospital. In uh, Los Angeles, you have Cedar Sinai Hospital. In Cincinnati, you have the Jewish Hospital. Why Sinai, Cedar Sinai, why Jewish Hospital? Because if Jews were excluded from hospitals, Jewish patients needed somewhere to go, Jewish doctors needed somewhere to work, therefore we developed counter institutions. Country clubs that excluded Jews led to the creation of Jewish country clubs. Hotels that excluded Jews led to the creation of the Borscht Belt and the Catskill Mountains outside of New York, which were hotels to which Jews could go. And the irony, of course, if you look in the history of the United States, the moment after the passage of the Civil Rights Act when Jews were admitted to any hotel, as were other peoples, that's the moment at which the Borscht Belt lost its character and lost, ironically, its raison d'etre. Political anti-Semitism says we want to diminish Jewish political power. In other countries, it led in history to expulsion and essentially diminishing Jewish political power. Think of that also in the chant said in Charlottesville, Virginia, but also in Poland, Jews will not replace us. Now, when Poland was 34 million people and Jews were 3.3 million of those 34 million people before the war, the idea that Jews will not replace us made sense, meaning one-tenth of the population could somehow replace or displace Polish Catholics, which is the, nation, or the nature of Polish ethnicity. But when Jews are 7,000 or 8,000 in a population of 60 million, what does it mean Jews will not replace us? And that means essentially that you're talking of a political displacement by advocating policies that call for what? Call for a pluralistic, multicultural, tolerant society rather than a Polish Roman Catholic society that is exclusionary and the like. And in the United States, the idea of the political attack against Jews, Jews will not replace us, meant that Jews were advocating policies that were diminishing white Anglo-Saxon Christian power in the United States. Anti and racial anti-Semitism we saw in Nazism, defining the Jews as a race and its ultimate question we're going to see in a moment. So anti-Semitism differs as to its source. Anti-Semitism also differs as to its goal. Religious anti-Semitism, the ultimate goal becomes conversion. If you're Christian then and no longer Jewish, then it's conversion only when that becomes both political and racial as, for example, in Spain when you got after the conversos is religious anti-Semitism insufficient because it's then linked to political and um, to political anti-Semitism and to social anti-Semitism and consequently in Spain was a distinction. Otherwise, the goal is conversion. Political anti-Semitism is the diminishment of Jewish political power. Economic anti-Semitism is the diminishment of Jewish economic power. Social anti-Semitism calls for segregation, isolation, and racial anti-Semitism 
ultimately called for what the Nazis said, extermination, and I try to use not Nazi speak, but uh, a, a, a term that speaks the language of the victim, and that is annihilation. To fully eliminate them, and we saw, and you spoke about reading Goldhagen's uh, book, or you spoke about reading Goldhagen's book, the notion that it moved from eliminationist anti-Semitism uh, to exterminationist anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism differs as to its priority. How much do you really care about it? In the case of Nazi Germany from Adolf Hitler, there is a seamless record from 1919 through the last day of his life in 1945. Anti-Semitism was his first, second, and third priority. And anti-Semitism was so strong that even at moments of crisis, no resources were what? Were given over that were not dedicated to the deportation and the destruction of the Jews. And consequently, it was the first priority. And the last word he uttered in his political testament was above all, he enjoined the German people to remember the Jews. What has been safety in the United States for Jews is anti-Semitism has not been the first priority. It hasn't been the second priority. It, happens, it hasn't been the third priority it probably even hasn't been the fourth or fifth priority. If you think in today's language, you look at the victimized groups and you ask what level is the victimization of Jews and the victimization of Jews is not number one, not number two, not number three, not number four, but much further down. And that's allowed for safety for the American Jewish community and the question of its priority becomes essential to understanding the role of anti-Semitism. And um, I had a, my, my wife had COVID um, last week and uh, I kid my, I, my wife is, is um, I, I love her, she's enormously talented, she's brilliant in all of this, she's also uh, uh, lovely, but she hates, to fail an exam. So we kept kidding her, my kids and I kept kidding her. You don't have to pass this exam when you take the COVID test. <laughs> fail it. <laughs> Get an F. <laughs> fail the bloody exam. So Jews, don't be the priority. Don't win the contest. Be fortunate that what? Be fortunate that you're further down the pike but that also means that you have to look to the other groups that are victimized and engage with them in solidarity. Anti-Semitism varies as to how endangered a society feels. The more stable a society, the better the condition of its Jewish population. My colleague Yitz Greenberg once said, Jews are the canary in the mine. Do you understand that in a mine you bring canary in because the canary makes noise before the oxygen level goes down to the like? You want to know how good a society is? See the way in which it treats its Jews. What is the problem in contemporary America? We have a health crisis. Hopefully it's dissipating. I see some of you with masks, some of you without masks. We have people remote. We have an economic crisis. We have a social justice crisis. We have a democracy crisis. We have a leadership crisis. We have a climate crisis, and we have a crisis of truth. And aside from that, we're in wonderful shape. But the reality is that we can elaborate on all of this and the elaboration is to say that we live in a society that is unstable and that feels itself unstable and is pulled apart. And part of that becomes the instability of society. The instability of society is a condition 
for the rise of um, anti-Semitism. By the way, uh, 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 the crisis of truth is a very important crisis. Uh, remember the great line of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, everybody's entitled to his opinion but not to his set of facts. And the problem in our society is people have decided what their set of facts are and their set of facts are a, an attempt to reinforce in a very deep, a deep way their opinion. Now, how does contemporary anti-Semitism differ from traditional anti-Semitism in several ways? The first and foremost, and this is directed to the people in the back of the room, the first and foremost thing is you guys are empowered in a way that no generation ever before has been empowered. We carry more power in this, and we were talking about it this, this evening at, at, at dinner, more power in this than the computers that used to take up the size of this chapel. And the reality is that the internet has become a megaphone entitling everyone to be able to disseminate their opinion without a great expenditure of time, effort, money, and discipline. And the second is, in a very deep way, is the social networks. The social networks become the way of mutual support, and that thwarts the idea that we can quarantine the haters because the haters find a mutual support system all the way through. This is unprecedented in our world, and it also says it's going to only get larger and larger, and we're now seeing even a bifurcation or an attempt to bifurcate the means of communication in order to reinforce the division so you do not have to receive opinions that are contrary to your own. No longer is the hater a loner. The hater now has the great support of community. And not only that, but it also has the notion of replication or duplication. Let me give you an example from the university, which is very interesting. You had a case at Syracuse University where a student went through the library and dropped the manifesto. I, I don't want to call it manifesto. The, dropped the, 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 the rage statement of the killer from New Zealand into the, into the phones of everybody who was in the library that day. So all of a sudden, a kill, isolated killer in Christ Crossing, New Zealand, becomes someone whose manifesto is then shared in the community of Syracuse University and dropped into all of these types of things and the like. And consequently, we have a radically different situation than we've ever had before. Let me say that not all the news is bad. And this I say primarily to my uh, friends in the Jewish community. Not all the news is bad. Let me give you three examples of where the news is ironically very different. If you look at the Pew survey, you find something very interesting, that Judaism is the most respected religion in America. Now, before you salute that, let me explain something. Judaism is really the least disrespected religion in America, and the documentation of that is very simply. The Roman Catholic Church has great divisions now between pew and pulpit, between the altar and the parishioners. Essentially, part of that is the result of the sexual abuse crisis within the church. Part of that also is that there, ironically, is a identical level of Roman Catholics who get divorced to the general American population, and only a slightly diminished percentage of population of Roman Catholics who have abortions with respect to the general American population. Protestantism is divided between evangelical and mainstream, 
and the evangelical community finds divisions over its own politics between the young and the old. My children's generation do not see much difference between being gay and being left-handed, and my younger kids are both left-handed. And that's true in the evangelical community as well. There's also concern about climate change in the evangelical community, and also a concern about linking the future to one political party and one political ideology, so there's division. Muslims have been associated with uh, terror and violence, and nobody understands Eastern religion. Ipso facto, Judaism becomes the least disrespected, or if you ask it the other way, the most respected religion in America. The second is that there's been a dramatic change, a change of gigantic proportions, theologically, religiously, liturgically, in the attitude of Christians toward Jews. The easiest way to demonstrate that is the changes in the Roman Catholic Church. 60 years ago, Nostra Tate, actually 58 years ago, Nostra Tate was proclaimed, which changed the view of the crucifixion. That has been followed with the, that was the career of St. Uh, uh, John the 23rd followed by the career of St. John Paul II, who did a couple, three things that were dramatic. Number one, he politically recognized the state of Israel, which is a manifestation of how Jews want to live their future, at least in part. Secondly, Pope John um, Paul II visited a synagogue to understand this, students, I want you to understand that Jews have lived in Rome before the advent of Christianity. And never once in the entire history of Jews and Roman Catholics coexisting in Rome had a pope ever visited a synagogue and prayed in a synagogue. And the, the pope is the bishop of Rome. John Paul prayed in a synagogue, and then when John Paul went to Israel, he prayed at the Western Wall, which is the last remnant of the Holy Temple. And prior to that, the perception in, in Roman Catholicism was that God abandoned the Jews when Jews rejected Jesus or when Jews did not convert and accept Jesus. Proof positive, their temple was destroyed, Jerusalem was shattered, Jews were exiled. Here he did, he went to the remnant of the temple. He put what we call a kvittel, he put a letter in, and he recognized, and remember Pope John Paul II was a man of the theater, so he recognized that the gesture was as important as what, as important as the statement, and he put a letter in apologizing for the anti-Semitism of Christians. And finally, he made a statement, anti-Semitism is anti-Christian, something that we had not heard in the multi-centuries, multi-millennium in which Jews and Christians coexisted. That is echoed within the Protestant denominations and the great uh, friendship uh, displayed by the evangelical community toward Israel changed transformation in Christianity. What did the current Pope Francis do? The current Pope Francis ended the mission to the Jews, saying, in essence, we don't need to convert the Jews. Jews are religiously whole with God. And that, again, one of the consequences of saying that Jews had fulfilled their mission with the coming of Jesus was that why do they continue to exist? Only because they were stiff-necked people who had no purpose in continuing to exist, except in Augustine's theology, we were going to be a witness people. At the end, we were going to indicate when Christ returned that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Consequently, we had a witness theology. So Christianity has changed its teaching vis-a-vis -vis Jews. And the other thing uh, about it, which is very important, is that um, the second collapse was the greatest source of communism in the last, uh, in the mid part of the 20th century, which was communism. And the collapse of communism, the whole notion of who pushed, for example, Zionism is racism, 
and the whole push of communism was, again, a tremendous thing from Marx onward with a great deal of anti-Semitism. So not all news is bad. And even Jewish measurement tools of anti-Semitism are, in one sense, a little bit obsolete. Uh, let me give you a, a very a couple of interesting examples. ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, has done a 60-year longitudinal study of anti-Semitism. And one of the things they asked the question is, do Jews control the economy? And if you said Jews controlled the economy, you were, that was a measurement of anti-Semitism. But what happened, let's go back to before the Biden administration, and what happened in when you asked the question, who's the chairman of the Federal Reserve? Chairman of the Federal Reserve was a Jew. Who was the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve? The vice chairman of the Federal Reserve was not only a Jew, but an Israeli Rhodesian American Jew. Who was the predecessor of the um, head of the Federal Reserve, a man by the name of Shalom Ben Bernanke, a Jew? Who was his vice chairman, another Jew? Who was the predecessor of that, a third Jew? Who was the Secretary of Treasury, a Jew? Who was the Secretary of Treasury before him, a Jew who was not only a Jew but an Orthodox Jew? And the Secretary of Treasury before him, a Jew? And the Secretary of Treasury before him, a Jew? There once was a time where there were Jewish banks, and now five of the seven banks in the United States, if largest banks in the United States, have chairman of boards who are Jews. So the question becomes, if you say the Jews have a disproportionate influence in the economy, you must say yes. If you use the nasty word, the Jews control the economy, or if you even move between control and mastery, you know, and, and uh, disproportionate influence, all of a sudden that moves you into a category of anti-Semitism. The measurement doesn't quite work. Um, I won an award in the media with a Roman Catholic priest and his son. But before you're scandalized, let me tell you the story. One of my closest friends and a guy I collaborate with in, in movies very often is a Roman Catholic priest but he became a priest after his wife died in his early 60s. And as he says it, it's much easier to be celibate in your 60s than it is in your teens. <laughs> and consequently, he was prepared in his 60s after he was a father and even a grandfather to take the vow and cherish the vow of celibacy much easier done in your 60s than, than, than in your teens. So there's no scandal there. And, but I tell the story because he always insists that when I speak about our collaboration that I make sure to cleanse his, his uh, keep his reputation deservedly pristine pure. Steven Spielberg was presenting uh, the award for Catholics in the media. He looked out at the audience and he said, oh my God, I didn't believe there were this many Gentiles in the business. The joke being, do Jews control the media? Nobody controls the media, especially now with all the zooming, with all the, the different uh, streaming services and the like. Are Jews disproportionately represented in it as yes, absolutely. Consequently, the measurement tools that we have for measuring anti-Semitism have to be changed. So those are dramatic changes. There's also a different change as well. And let's touch on the issue of Israel for a moment. I'm going to give you a 10 second lesson in Zionism. Zionism was born in the late 19th century at a moment when Jews felt that they were not really going to be given adequate civil rights. And the only way that the Jewish future could be determined or the Jewish question be solved was in a very basic way when the Jews were given, had a state, an army, and a flag, and were a nation like any other nation. That was the assumption of Theodor Herzl before him of Leo Pinsker, and it's been an assumption all along. 
the presumption was that Israel would solve the problem of anti-Semitism. And for a short time, twice in the last half century, it looked like Israel would solve the problem of anti-Semitism. If you ask Jews after June 1967 how tall they were, all of a sudden they became six foot six. And everybody became powerful. And that was a universal experience because Israel represented a moment of Jews not as old victims, but all of a sudden, sudden as triumphant fighters. And we were gonna narrate our history that in one generation, in 22 years, Jews had gone from Auschwitz to a reunified Jerusalem. Wow, what a future comes along 1973 and you have the oil crisis and we begin to understand that, and people say, let's burn Jews, not oil. And we begin to understand in a very dramatic way what? That Israel can also fuel the flames of anti-Semitism and not only quench the fires. And the second time was in 93, right after the Camp David Accords, when it looked like Israel might achieve peace with its Arab neighbors and consequently, all of a sudden, it looked like Israel was going to quench anti-Semitism. The reality is we've seen in the last uh, 30 years that one of the faces of anti-Semitism is anti-Israel sentiment. Now understand this, and this is critically important. Not all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, and much criticism of Israel is deserved. Israel is a human community done by human beings of various talents and ideologies. And like there is much to criticize in the United States, there is much to criticize in Israel. What is the test between normal criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism? And this is a tremendous uh, debate within all elements of the Jewish community today and of the world today. Frankly, there are competing definitions of anti-Semitism. There also is a recognition in a very particular way. Uh, I don't know how many of you remember the great statement of Justice Potter Stewart. Justice Potter Stewart said of pornography, I can't define it, but I can recognize it when I see it. The other justice on the Supreme Court was William Douglas, who had an absolutist position with regard to freedom of speech and he said, my poor friend Potter Stewart has to spend all day watching pornographic movies. I've seen none because I believe all movies should be permissible and I don't want to censor anything. And Potter Stewart wants to see it. How are we going to define it? Well, some of us feel we know it when we see it and we've been given a language with which to define anti-Semitism as opposed to normal, good, vital, important criticism of the state of Israel. The three test cases are what we call the three Ds, double standards, delegitimation, demonization. If you judge Israel by one standard and the rest of the democratic world by another standard, you are moving toward anti-Semitism. If you say that Israel is founded on land that belonged to other people, therefore it has no right to exist, the question is, that's delegitimation. What about the United States? What about Canada? What about Australia? What about multiple countries in the world today? If you're willing to say that about everybody, you may be wrong, you may, but you're not anti-Semitic. If you say that only about Israel, we have to ask the question, are you or are you not? And the third element is demonization, and that is you regard Jews and Israel as the source of all evil. They are demonic. And we see that in a very particular way in all sorts of expressions. We had a George Soros-sponsored invasion of the United States from Mexico. That was the accusation, a demonic thing. You regard Israel as poisoning the wells. You have conspiracy theories that say because a Jew C Jewish CEO of Pfizer helped develop the vaccine, the Jews must have brought what? They must have brought COVID-19 in order to profit from the vaccine itself. 
and the notion of Jews as demonic echoes a danger all the way through. But even there, not all news is bad. You just had something quite remarkable uh, day before yesterday, or actually on Monday, that was overshadowed by all the terrible events happening in the Ukraine. And that is you had a meeting of four foreign ministers, uh, five foreign ministers, of the United States, of the UAE, of um, uh, Israel, of Morocco, and of the United States in the Negev at Ben-Gurion's kibbutz, Stabokar. You had a meeting of them uh, because of the Abraham Accords. A whole range of um, Arab countries have now decided that they would rather make peace with Israel than face Iran without Israel. They made peace with Israel for two reasons. Number one, the division in the, uh, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, between Sunni and Shiite is very deep. And number two, they felt that Israel offers the greatest protection against the Sunni bomb, which is with respect to Iran. And furthermore, they felt something else, which is that Israel is equipped in a knowledge-based economy, Israel is equipped to handle the technological skills, the integration of the population to handle the economies of the 21st century. You in the back of the room are students. The most important thing that we can tell you is that what you need to get out of your university education is not knowledge, but the ability of how to gain knowledge. And that is that the world is moving toward a knowledge-based economy. And the greater society will be is the greater it can use the skills of its population. That means we have to use not only the skills of men, but also the skills of women. That also means we have to use the skills of young people, and also, we're not quite yet ready to be fully obsolete. Some of us old folks still want to be useful and offer something. It means we have to offer the skills, of, we have to use the skills of the immigrant, we have to use the skills of people of multicolors, of multi backgrounds. And all of us in higher education know that, for example, foreign students were a source of a brain drain to the United States' benefit. And consequently, all of that knowledge-based economy. Israel is fully equipped for the knowledge-based economy. And consequently, if you tell me about BDS, then my answer to you is, OK, I agree with BDS. Now, give me your iPhones. Give me your Microsoft programs. Let's get rid of the way in which the library is organized. Don't use Waze. Don't use Skype. And don't use, all, don't use any of the medical information that we've gained from Israeli medicine. What does that mean? It means that the Arab countries that are moving toward a knowledge-based economy because they won't forever be able to pump oil are the Arab countries that are going to join forces with Israel, which, pu which pushes for, which pushes for a diminishment, now it's a piece of the elite, it will very soon be a piece that will have to be translated down to the street. All of you know that in the case of divorce, the, last que the, the, the major question you ask is, when do we tell the kids? And the Arab elites are at some point going to have to say, we've made peace with Israel. It can't be all that evil, all that awful, because now there are allies, and once you do that, all of a sudden that promises to diminish anti-Semitism. Let me close with three basic points. And uh, I'm, when I say I'm about to close, I, I, I remember that I came to Washington years ago when the definition of an optimist was the woman who put on her high heels after Hubert Humphrey said, in conclusion, for the 13th time. <laughs> And since most of you don't know who Hubert Humphrey was, Hubert Humphrey was a vice president of the United States between 1964 and 1968. 
And Hubert Humphrey never met a speech he didn't want to give and never met a speech that he couldn't give in two hours or more. In my mid-career, the optimist was the woman who put on her shoes when Bill Clinton said in conclusion, and I want to come to two conclusions right now. The first, anti-Semitism today cannot in the United States be distinguished from the permissibility of the expression of hatreds to its towards all groups in the United States who are not the groups we like. And that is that we've lost the norm that used to be if you were an anti-Semite, you could think it, but you couldn't say it. If you were racist, you couldn't say it, you couldn't act it except in certain segments of the country. And now the mark of authenticity is the fact that you can hate in the open. And that's a, a, a destruction of the norm of civility and the norm of self-restraint and the norm of fundamental elements of decency. Very important that we not lose that norm. So if you say, is hatred of the Jews on the rise? Yes. Is hatred of African Americans on the rise? Yes. Is hatred of immigrants on the rise? Yes. Is hatred of Hispanics? on the rise, yes, is hatred of, of uh, gays on the rise, yes, is hatred of the, uh, of the transgenders on the rise, yes. We live in a society where if you hate, you feel that you are authentic for expressing your hatred. And the only response to that is to reimpose that norm of decency, not necessarily by cancel culture, but perhaps by more subtle means in terms of that. The second thing that we have to say is that the oppressed groups now are not without means. I tell my Jewish community in a very simple way. There is an imbalance between your self-perception and the perception of the, other, of the rest of the world of Jews. Jews see themselves as a minority. They are perceived in the United States as a privileged part of the white majority. The groups that don't see Jews as part of the white majority are groups that want to begin to exclude Jews, who see the white majority as a white Christian majority, and therefore we are what? We are regarded as outliers or as conditionally white. Part of our sense of privilege means that people can't see hatred of Jews even when it happens because privileged people aren't supposed to be victims. But we have to understand that this is a tension inherently all the way through. And the last point, and this is the fundamental reason that I think seeing everything through the lens of the Holocaust is incorrect. If you fight the last war, you're not prepared for the contemporary one. And that is if we see everything through the prism of the Holocaust, the United States is not going to create gas chambers. They're not going to deport us. They're not going to be concentration camps and death camps. That type of racial anti-Semitism where Jews are regarded as a cancer on society and their elimination is the only means for the preservation of the future, that's gone. We live in a much more subtle, much more um, complex, and much more sophisticated form of anti-Semitism with new challenges and these challenges will only increase in the aftermath of COVID, which is the reason why I feel ashamed, as it were, to be relevant. Thank you very much.
time for a few questions. Uh, Rabbi, Dr. Barenbaum has assured me he loves questions. Uh, okay. So I only have one rule of questions. I have two rules of questions. Number one, you can't ask permission to ask a question. Ask a question. And number two, I have found that um, my generation of students were arrogant. We would stand up and ask a question. We now have a generation of students that somehow, perhaps they're not here at, at, at Greensboro, but who are a little bit shy and they say, I'm not sure it may be the case, perhaps it is the case, but I'm not certain. Uh, ask your question, if you're wrong, we'll stand you up, we'll make fun of you, put you in the back of the room and laugh. And since that's not the way we're going to behave, just ask your question and feel free to ask it. Any questions, please? And speak up. And since, I, and since I'm with a microphone that's on the lapel, I can go closer to you guys. Any questions? Yes, sir. A, that's a terrific question. If I had the answer, I would be on the road more often. But let me, let me, let me suggest a couple of things. The first is, uh, and you know, we were, we were, the first is to engage in conversation. Let it hang out. But let it hang out in such a way that we're really engaged in dialogue, we listen to each other, and we have a sense of where you're coming from and where I'm coming from. And also with the idea that um, let's separate facts from opinion. And let's have our facts down and let's then understand our opinion. But part of it is we have to learn to listen to each other. Um, we have to talk with each other instead of at each other. Um, we, have a theologian in, we have a theologian in the room and one of the people that, that I learned from was a man by the name of Martin Buber. And Martin Buber believed in a principle of dialogue. In dialogue, there is conversation, and I am open to change, and you are open to change. What we now have is mutual monologues. And we have gotcha. And the goal is not to hear, the goal is to score points. And we see this, I mean, this is the constant th refrain that we have in, in the 24-hour news cycle. Everybody's talking off of what? Talking points. And you hear everybody in every con everything, they're trying to score points. Now, uh, this weekend you're going to have North Carolina against Duke, and the only goal of the basketball game is to score points. And I'm not going to say who I'm going to be in favor of, with regard to that, especially not in North Carolina. <laughs> I want to, want to be able to someday leave North Carolina. <laughs> but the only goal of a basketball game is to score points against your opponent in a fair and you know, in an, an honorable way. The point of engaging somebody else is to hear, listen, to learn. And that's the, that's the purpose of conversation. So the more we can do that, the better we come to a conclusion that makes sense. Other questions? Yes? You gotta, you gotta use the microphone because I can't hear you. And you look like a big fellow who can talk out loud. Uh, what does it take to be successful? What is what? Like, how did you become successful? Like, what was your path like? You know? Want me to tell my story? I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to tell. I'm happy to tell. Um, let me tell two stories about um, about professors in college, which I learned. And you know, Jason and I were talking about it. Part of what you learn in college is in the classroom, and part of what you learn in college is in the hall and in conversation. I was once in the. Um, office of my professor 
and my professor had got a call. And my professor got a call, and, and they had a wonderful, and I heard the word, yes, yes, when? Yes, okay. And he hung up. And I had the audacity to say, what was that about? <laughs> he said, well, they just called from this journal that was the hottest journal of the moment in the 70s. That's ancient history for you. In the 70s, it was the hottest journal called Psychology Today. They wanted me to uh, review B.F. Skinner's Beyond Freedom and Dignity. So they said, would you be interested in reviewing B.F. Skinner's Beyond Freedom and Dignity? He said, yes. Um, when do you need it by? They gave me a date. What do you know about B.F. Skinner? Skinner? He said, enough. And will you be able to deliver? I said, yes. So then I said to him, what do you really know about B.F. Skinner? He says, I don't know a damn thing, but by the time I finish, I will know enough. <laughs> and I learned something very interesting, which is that if opportunity comes your way, take it but don't abuse it and be ready to really amass it, be ready to really make it and do it. Second one was uh, a, an interesting thing, and this goes back, you had a, a six-hour PhD thesis defense. PhD thesis defense, there used to be a, a thing in, in ancient society called the trial by ordeal. <laughs> you were put out in the woods, you either died or you came back, the end of a couple of weeks and the like. In, in, in academia, we're nicer, we just put you through the gruel. So, I'm with a guy who's married two children, he has a job, he's got a wonderful opportunity, and three people love his dissertation, one fourth professor hates it. And he's taking them over the coals. And then, the professor, uh, he goes into the professor, he goes into the office, and he says, why are they loving it and you're hating it? And he says, you're asking the wrong question. I said, what do you mean I'm asking the wrong question? You're beating me up, you're not take, accepting my word. Why are you willing to sign your name to work that's not the best that you can do? And I learned from that conversation that I never put my name on something that's not the best that I can do. And I've been fortunate in life, uh, and uh, I'll tell you what happened to me personally, which you'll, you'll get a kick out of. I became director of the creation of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum after they had um, five executive directors who failed. Now, Imagine you're on your sixth marriage. You've got to realize it can't be all her fault. <laughs> right? Sixth marriage, even if you're perfect, you've got to imagine after five failures, something must be your fault. So they, they decided that they had taken people who knew museums but didn't know the Holocaust. So they said, let's take somebody who knows the Holocaust and can learn museums. So I said, okay, I'm gonna take that job even though five people before me had gone out in flames, because I know the Holocaust, but by the time I really get to work on this, I'm gonna learn museums. So I went to every bloody museum I could find, met with anybody who knew anything about it, and by the time I got into the position to really make the decisions, I knew what I knew, and equally enough, I knew what I didn't know, but I knew who to ask about what I didn't know. Years later, I taught, years earlier, I taught at the Naval Academy. Naval Academy had one tremendous ethic. If I called on a midshipman and he didn't know the answer, she didn't know the answer, she had to get up and say, do not know, sir, in, in Naval Academy, they treat their professors as if they're officers. Do not know, sir, but we'll find out, sir. And you had to write down what you asked the person and what their name was. At the beginning of the next class, you had to get the answer from them. Why? Because an officer could not, did not have to know everything, but could never be satisfied with ignorance. They had to decide that they were going to learn what they didn't know. 
And one of the great joys I've had in life is I've worked in an area I knew, in an area I didn't know and continued to grow. And I've now reached a, I, I've now reached a wonderful stage of, 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 of the game. One of the advantages of being much older than you is I don't have to make my reputation, I have to be careful not to lose my reputation. And that means that you, you really have to take the same things that you took when you were making your reputation and making sure you don't go easy on yourself as you have a reputation. And the most important thing, I mean this for you as an undergraduate or, a, or even a graduate school, the most important thing for you to take from your learning is the confidence and the ability to continue to learn. And now, uh, we're honoring a professor today who wrote a book 52 years ago. The definition of a classic in life is a book that's in print for 50 years. So he wrote a classic book 52 years ago. His wife told me today that the Twisted Road for Auschwitz was written about what he knew 50 years ago. 55 years ago, because he didn't write it in one day. She now has the work that he's on what he learned ever since, which is a different book. Doesn't make the first book wrong or less valuable, it makes to what he learned in the next 52 years more valuable, more important, which has to come out. So that's a little bit of my story. Opportunity comes your way, rise for it, but make sure you're prepared to do the work in order to be equal to the opportunity. If you're an athlete and you're playing a game, you gotta train like hell so you're never tired. You gotta push your body beyond its endurance to be able to get that extra step. I never sign my, I've never given a blurb to a book I haven't read from cover to cover. I've never written a, a review where I haven't read it from cover to cover and where I haven't read two or three other things to make sure that I know what the hell I'm talking about. Sometimes I work in areas I don't know. That's when I really learn the most. But I learn later, I, I learn by that, if I don't know it, who does know it? And then I seek to learn from them. And that's what I can tell you as an older person who's gone through a little bit of life's journey. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. What's your motivation? Why do you continue doing this work after all this time? What's my motivation? Look, I once taught, you know where I learned to be a teacher? I learned to be a teacher by teaching Sunday school on Sunday morning. I taught Sunday school on Sunday morning to high school kids. What's the last place high school kids want to be on a Sunday morning? Class. If you had a wonderful date on Saturday night, you're exhilarated. If you had a lousy date on Saturday night, you're depressed. Either way, you don't want to be in class. So I had to learn how to be a good teacher because I was teaching kids who were not motivated by any means to learn. So I have always remained a teacher, and every once in a while I go back into the high school classroom because you're easy to talk to, high school kids are worse. And the worse than that, the one you really have to work with is junior high school kids, who should really be on the schoolyard instead of in a classroom. Because when I was 13, 14, I couldn't sit still. I may not be able to sit still now, but I can sit still better now than then. So my motivation is, look, I think I have something to say. I think I have something to learn. I think the world needs to hear what I learned, and I need to hear what I don't learn, which is why the hell I work. Good enough answer? Other questions? Yes, sir. Want to bring a microphone so I can hear him? Earlier, you brought up uh, the usage of cell phones and young kids. So as us, young athletes, where 
cell phone usage, social media play such a big part in our lives. How would you say that we go about not letting that influence us to hate or, you know what I mean? Yeah, let me, let me say two things about the cell phone. The most important thing about the cell phone is you can't limit your world to this. I create museums and I create films. And the last thing I want to, you, to happen to you in a museum is to get all your information from here. I want you to experience what your eyes can see. I want you to experience what your ears can hear. I want you to experience smell. I want you to experience beauty. I want you to experience majesty. This is a tremendous tool. Tremendous tool. But it's not the whole world. Secondly, the dilemma we have, uh, look, I, I managed to staff 150 when email was invented. Now, when email was, uh, not when it was invented, when it was first used in office. You know what happened in the first year? I didn't do any management, I did crisis management. People put things in email they would never say in person. And people forgot to delete all of the trailers and people heard all sorts of things about everything that they weren't intended to them. I don't tweet and I don't Twitter <laughs> for a very basic reason because I don't believe that every one of my thoughts deserves an audience. I'm not even sure I want to listen to every one of my thoughts. And I, I, used to have a, I used to have a professor whom I won't name, one of the great scholars of the last generation, and we used to joke he never had an unpublished thought. If he thought something, he wrote it. Thought you should say drop dead, he said drop dead. If you should die of cancer, you should die of cancer. Didn't have an un, unpublished thought. Part of your generation and the, the cell phone culture and the Twitter and the tweet and, and, and the like is that you think that everything that happens to you has to be shared with the world. It's got to be a zone of privacy. And not, not only that, but there's got to be things that take you time to really understand. Now, one of the things that, that, that has happened in a, a very interesting way, uh, I'm a historian. And I'm also, by training a theologian, one of the great avenues we used to have was a diary. You know, some of the greatest works of theology were written as diaries, and some of the greatest information you get in history is written as diaries. What was diary? It was a person's self-reflection. But the moment self-reflection became shared with the entire world at the very beginning, and then you respond to it all the way through, it be ceases to be reflective. And I'm old fashioned enough to say, let's keep it a little bit reflective. So phone gives you tremendous power, tremendous opportunity. World is open to you. That doesn't mean you gotta exploit every opportunity that's there. It means you should use it wisely and a little bit sometimes even humbly. Any other questions? Yeah, please. So first of all, I'm really sorry my dad wouldn't be here to hear this. I think he would have enjoyed this very much, and thank you for that. Um, you may have answered the question, and I'm closer to your generation than I am to theirs, but these are ubiquitous. We all have one. Do you have any suggestions for how to use it for good? Look, I think we use it for good all the time. Emil, I, I, I checked into my airplane for tomorrow. That's using it for, that's using it for good. I mean, I mean for good in that, furtherance that, uh, Look, uh, let, me, let me give you, let me, uh, no, look. G give me an example. I can now stay in touch with, uh, I, I do a lot of work in Eastern Europe. So I have Kali, I, and by the way, I was supposed to be in Ukraine two weeks ago. You know, they didn't bother, for some reason, I don't understand, they didn't bother to cancel my meeting. Can you imagine the discourtesy, they didn't even cancel my meeting. 
I, the, ir the irony is I was supposed to be at Bobby R. Bobby R is the place where they uh, murdered 33,771 Jews on the 28th and 29th of September. And we wanted to get material from Bobby R for an exhibition I'm working on. We had signed an agreement and I was going to go to Bobby R. Lo and behold, the Russians attacked and, and destroyed the town. What does it mean? It means I can be in touch with these people. It means I can talk to them. It means that, that, that I have the opportunity to assist. It means that when I sat down, uh, uh, you know, to, to write my checks for the month, I people. It also means something else happened, which is fantastic. Want to hear something good about the world? Yes. <laughs> $26 million was done on Airbnb in two days in Ukraine. People rented apartments or rooms or hotel rooms on Airbnb to give, not because they intended to go, but it was a way of giving an income to people who put their property up. Now, I heard that on the phone. I, I therefore said, okay, I, you know, I have a little bit of money. I got to rent an Airbnb. So I rented an Airbnb in three different cities. That's good. Uh, if, if somebody has the opportunity to, you know, who's providing food? But what about my friend? You know, my friend who's working on, working on the front lines. You know, you work on the front lines, you're exhausted. I call him and I say, how can I help you? And he says, let me cry. It's good. There are all sorts of things the phone empowers you to do. It empowers you to keep on top of the world and to know. It, empower, it, it empowers, look, it, it, it empowers also for us to use what used to be, uh, some of this is bad, what used to be downtime is uptime. Um, you know, I'll give you one example of where it's good and bad, okay? We used to have a conversation. There were two places in the world where you could have a wonderful conversation. One is walking the beach, right? And the other was taking a long drive on the interstate. Took a long drive on the interstate. You spoke to your kids. You spoke to your wife. You know. Now you're handling business all the way through. So the phone enables me not to lose time, but also means that all of a sudden I can't have what used to be the uninterrupted time. And I used to say to, to my kids or to my wife, let's take a drive, right? Or let's take a walk. Now, I, I'm a religious Jew, so I shut off the media on Shabbat. And frankly, I don't know how people don't decompress. I have, you know, 25 hours in which I don't grapple with the media. That's driven. Now, by the way, at the end of the 25 hours, I'm like this. <laughs> and and I, I, I learned something else, which is my grandfather used to, my grandfather was a, a, a pious Jew, and my grandfather used to smoke. And my grandfather smoked terribly. He, he used to light one cigarette from the other. Comes Friday night, my grandfather stopped smoking. So I used to say, Zeta, if you stop smoking for 25 hours, what's wrong with the 26th hour, 27th hour, 28th hour? And my grandfather lit his cigarette from the Havdalah candle, the candle we light at the end, <laughs> the candle that we light at, light at the end. You have to decompress, but he de you decompress in order to recompress. So I said, look, God, to God told you not to endanger your body, so don't smoke the rest of the week. Because one of the things we learned was that smoking was awful. I hate to say that in tobacco country, but it's also true. Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.